Hello to all of our podcast listeners and a special hello to all of our broadcast outlets that are carrying This Week in Amateur Radio. Now celebrating our 23rd year of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all-amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1,238 with a release and air date of Saturday, November 19th, 2022. Please take the program to your air following the Q-Tone. It is time for another adventure into the latest news happening in the wider world of amateur radio and communications. Now in our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1,238 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Popular shortwave broadcaster WTWW signs off the air and goes QRT. The AWRL announces its 2022 Board of Directors election results. The Dayton Hamvention announces the theme for the 2023 show. The AWRL New England Division receives a large grant to help combat radio frequency interference. The FCC unveils its new detailed broadband maps and launches its broadband nutrition label program. The Internet Archive's new digital library of amateur radio and communications surpasses the 25,000 item mark. Eastern Massachusetts welcomes a new section manager while incumbent managers were declared elected. A fishing vessel in distress receives aid from the Maritime Mobile Net. Astronaut Bob Benkin, KG5GGX, retires from NASA. We will have an update from the FCC on its upcoming honors program and the New York State Police congratulates radio amateurs for a successful 2023 Pumpkin Patrol. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will take a close-up look at your modem and your often-neglected home network router. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, what exactly is in a VFO? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will take us back to the IRTC Treaty Conference held on November 4, 1927, which superseded the U.S. Radio Act and finally established amateur radio under international law. We will have the latest news from Parks on the Air and Summits on the Air with Mike Hare, N3MWV, and our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will tell you the best methods to follow when you need to climb your tower with a partner. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, where we thankfully missed all of the snow that they're getting out west in Buffalo, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Reporting from just outside the capital of New York State in Glenmont, New York, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the Catskills of upstate New York, where the weatherman has smacked us around a bit with some rain, ice, and a trace of snow. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where this week we got our first snow accumulation, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. We have several late-breaking stories to bring you first off this week. The first is the 2022 AWRL Board of Directors election results. 
AWRL Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, overcame challengers for his position in the 2023 and 2025 election cycle. Ballots counted November 18th showed Baker with 2,785 votes, defeating challengers Vice Director James Schilling, KG4JSZ, with 1,000 votes, and John Willis, KB4DU, with 673 votes. For the position of Vice Director, Jeff Beals, WA4AW, won with 1,516 votes. Beals is from Lakahatchee, Florida. He defeated challengers Andrew Mazzulli, KK4LWR, with 1,287 votes, and Neil Sulmeyer, K4EA, with 859 votes, and Joseph Tertilli, N4ZUW, with 763 votes. Baker and Beals have been declared elected for terms beginning January 1, 2023. Baker is finishing his first term as an AWRL director. He currently serves on the Administrative and Finance Committee and also the Logbook of the World Committee. Southeastern Division members had the option to vote using paper or electronic ballots. The election was conducted by Third Party Election Services Company of Melville, New York, which had been selected by the AWRL Ethics and Elections Committee. The tabulation was observed by A&E Chair Midwest Division Director Ard Zeigelbaum, K0AIZ. Those were the only contested races in this year's election cycle for director and vice director. In August, the incumbents in four divisions running unopposed in this election cycle were declared winners. They are Pacific Division Director Christine McIntyre, K6WX, and Vice Director Anthony Marson, W7XM. In the Rocky Mountain Division, Director Jeff Ryan, K0RM, and Vice Director Dan Grady, N2SRK, were declared elected. Southwestern Division Director Richard Dorton, N6AA, and Vice Director Richard Stearns, AA7A. And West Gulf Division Director John Robert Stratton, N5AUS, and Vice Director Lee Cooper, W4LHC. AWRL is governed by its Board of Directors. Elections are held for five of the 15 AWRL divisions each year for terms of three years. As promised, the FCC has released its first draft of a new broadband availability map meant to more accurately represent broadband coverage as the Biden administration pushes tens of billions of dollars towards its universal broadband pledge. The new interactive map shows location-level information about broadband availability, an upgrade from the census-level data the Federal Communications Commission previously collected, and which had allowed some broadband dead zones to appear live if they were in census blocks with service elsewhere. The FCC has signaled the maps are an ongoing process that will be improved by challenges to any errors. The better maps were mandated by Congress, but the FCC was already at work on improving its broadband data collection, which had been roundly criticized on the Hill. Today is an important milestone in our effort to help everyone, everywhere, get specific information about what broadband options are available for their homes and pinpointing places in the country where communities do not have the service they need, FCC Chair Jessica Rosenworcel said. By painting a more accurate picture of where broadband is and is not, local, state, and federal partners can better work together to ensure no one is left on the wrong side of the digital divide. Those state partners are particularly in need of assistance as they hand out tens of billions in new broadband subsidy money. In addition to the map, the FCC also launched an updated version of its speed test app that broadband subs can use to compare their actual mobile broadband performance and coverage to their providers' reported performance and coverage, then submit that information as part of a challenge to the map if their service coverage doesn't measure up. The Federal Communications Commission has approved rules for implementing the new broadband labels required by Congress. The commission had been contemplating such a label for several years and came out with a voluntary version in 2016. The use of the label was since mandated in the Biden administration's Infrastructure Act with its billions in broadband subsidies, so the commission is at the task in earnest. 
The FCC report and order, which is the final decision barring appeal, requires broadband providers to display the service nutrition labels, which include prices, speeds, fees, and any data allowances at the point of sale. That means the actual label, not a link to the label or an icon, must be prominently displayed in proximity to any ads, as well as easily accessible to the customer's online account portals. The information also has to be machine readable. While the label has to be on ISP websites, ads, and other marketing materials, it does not have to be on monthly bills, which did not please label fan Consumer Reports. Consumer Reports hopes the FCC will revisit this ruling and require ISPs to provide a broadband label on every monthly bill, Consumer Reports said. The FCC also has signaled it is willing to refine and improve the labels and adopted a further notice of proposed rulemaking so that stakeholders can weigh in on those. By moving forward to implement broadband nutrition labels, the FCC will help empower consumers to make informed choices in today's highly competitive broadband marketplace. Jonathan Spalter, president of UST Telecom, the Broadband Association, said, Consumers have lots of options when selecting their services, and these new labels should be a simple tool to help with comparison shopping. And now with what was this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Terry? Leading off the news this week, shortwave fans worldwide were disappointed to hear the November 9th broadcast announcement of WTWW Radio that it was signing off the air for the last time, with plans to continue to provide programming instead over the internet. The station's operator, Ted Randall, WB8PUM, cited difficulties in meeting the station's ongoing expenses. Based in Lebanon, Tennessee, WTWW provided a wide range of programming at 5.83 MHz, along with music and amateur radio content at 5.085 MHz. The station was among many to broadcast programming directed toward Ukraine following the invasion by Russia earlier this year. The station went on the air in 2010 as the 100 kilowatt operation WBWW and could be heard first on what were test frequencies of 5.755 MHz and 9.48 MHz at different times. Over the years, WTWW gained an especially strong following among amateur radio operators for carrying ham-related content. The station also featured program hosts such as Art Bell, W6OBB, who presented a popular show on the paranormal. According to the SW Listening Post, the station's final sign-off included a farewell from Ted that urged listeners to make the move to web streaming its content. The station's final song was America the Beautiful. By virtue of its call sign, WTWW was also known as We Transmit Worldwide. To continue hearing the station's streamed programs, point your web browser or digital device at wtww.us forward slash pages forward slash listen dash live dot php. Once again, wtww.us forward slash pages forward slash listen dash live dot php. Some of WTWW's programming is also becoming available on the commercial shortwave station WRMI, Radio Miami International. WRMI is airing the content as WRMI Legends. A new private WRMI Legends fan listener club page has been launched on Facebook. Dayton Hamvention 2023 is just over six months away, and next year's Hamvention team has selected innovation as the event theme. John Ross, KB8 IDJ, is here with more details. The team reports that in just one word, the theme encompasses the world of amateur radio today. There are so many exciting innovations worldwide in amateur radio. We want to capture the spirit, and we expect to see many of these throughout the coming year and presented at Hamvention 2023, said Hamvention 2023 spokesman Michael Coulter, WHCI. Dayton Hamvention is the largest annual amateur radio gathering in the U.S. and among the largest in the world. With nearly 700 volunteers, next year's event boasts more than 500 indoor exhibits and more than 2,500 outdoor exhibits. They will showcase the latest in amateur radio equipment, technology, and computer software and hardware, along with hard-to-find radio and computer accessories and equipment. In a message to the 2022 exhibitors, Inside Invention Chairman Mike Bulger announced on Friday 14th that the online vendor portal is now open to accept credit card orders for the 2023 show. There will be no price increase for the vendor booths, and early bird pricing is available through March 15th of 2023. 
Inside exhibit vendors who had booths for the 2022 show will have until March 15th to pay for their booths in full. And all booths not paid for by March 15th will be made available to the public at the full rate. ARRL is planning its large exhibit area and overall participation for the event. And Hamvention is an ARRL-sanctioned event. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Hamvention 2023 runs from May 19th through the 21st at the Greene County Fairgrounds in Zinnia, Ohio. Tickets are on sale now and can be purchased at hamvention.org slash purchase dash tickets. More information about Hamvention 2023 is available on their website. Radio frequency interference, better known as RFI, has become an issue for many radio amateurs in the past decade. Solar energy systems, LEDs, switching power supplies, dimmers, variable speed motor controllers, and other nonlinear devices have all raised the noise floor. This impacts radio amateurs across the board, including those participating in emergency communications, traffic handling, and those talking with friends on the air. In some cases, it makes communicating via amateur radio all but impossible. To combat this problem, the ARRL New England Division has created teams to help radio amateurs find sources of RFI and eliminate or reduce the interference. These teams are also able to provide additional assistance when required, such as working with utility companies, the ARRL, or even the FCC. A $23,640 grant for Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC, will allow the New England Division to purchase radio frequency interference equipment for each of the seven sections in their division. Each kit will have the following equipment. ICOM IC705 transceiver outfitted with a backpack and spare battery for RFI detection and spectrum capture. DX engineering noise loop, receiving antenna and a DXENLPREATT1 preamplifier attenuator to detect sources of high-frequency RFI, ELK antennas 2-meter slash 440 L5, dual-band antenna for locating RFI sources in the VHF and UHF portions of the spectrum. In addition, the division will be purchasing a radar engineering RE243 broadband RFI locator for detecting power line noise and a radar engineering RE245 circuit sniffer for detecting indoor noise sources. This equipment will be dispatched to the sections when needed. The funds will also help the division with on-site training for all seven New England section teams. Rob Lydon, K1UI, Assistant Director for Spectrum Protection and Utilization notes, this grant will really help our dedicated teams combat RFI throughout the New England division. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of internet communications. The organization got its start by managing the AMPR net address space, which is reserved for licensed amateur radio operators worldwide. Additionally, ARDC makes grants to projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communication science. Such experimentation has led to advances that benefit the general public, including the mobile phone and wireless internet technology. ARDC envisions a world where all such technology is available through open source hardware and software, and where anyone has the ability to innovate upon it. To learn more about ARDC, go to www.ampr.org. John McCombie, N1ILZ, will become the section manager of the ARRL Eastern Massachusetts section on January 1st of 2023. McCombie of Easton was the only nominee submitted to select a petition to run when the nomination period closed in early September. As the sole nominee, he has been declared elected. This past year, McCombie has been assistant section manager to Tom Walsh, K1TW, who has been the section manager of the Eastern Massachusetts section for the last eight years. Walsh of Bedford decided not to run for a fifth two-year term of office. There were no balloted elections during this fall season section manager election cycle. The following incumbent section managers ran unopposed and they were declared re-elected, beginning their new two-year term of office on January 1. Cecil Higgins, AC0HA in Missouri. Matt Anderson, KA0BOJ in Nebraska. Jim Maisie, W2KFV in New York City, the Long Island section. Rocco Conti, 
WU2M in northern New York, Mark Tarpley, N4UFP in South Carolina, Tom Prizer, N2XW in southern New Jersey, Michael Douglas, W4MOD in west central Florida, and Joe Schupinus, W3BC in western Pennsylvania. In the six weeks since announcing that Internet Archive has begun gathering content for the Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications, or DLARC, the project has quickly grown to more than 25,000 items, including ham radio newsletters, podcasts, videos, books, and catalogs. The project seeks additional contributions of material for the free online library. You are welcome to explore the content currently in the library and watch the primary collection as it grows at archive.org forward slash details forward slash DLARC. Again, that's archive.org forward slash details forward slash DLARC. The new material includes historical and modern newsletters from diverse amateur radio groups, including the National Radio Club of Aurora, Colorado, the Telford and District Amateur Radio Society based in the United Kingdom, the Malta Amateur Radio League, and the South African Radio League. The Tri-State Amateur Radio Society contributed more than 200 items of historical correspondence, newspaper clippings, ham festival flyers, and newsletters. Other publications include Selvamar Noticias, a multilingual digital ham radio magazine, and Florida Skip, an amateur radio newspaper published from 1957 through 1994. The library also includes the complete run of 73 magazine, more than 500 issues, which are freely and openly available. More than 300 radio-related books are available in DLARC via controlled digital lending. These materials may be checked out by anyone with a free Internet Archive account for a period of one hour to two weeks. Radio and communication books donated to Internet Archive are scanned and added to the DLARC Lending Library. Amateur radio podcasts and video channels are also among the first batch of material in the DLARC collection. These include Ham Nation, Foundations of Amateur Radio, the ICQ Amateur and Ham Radio Podcast, with many more to come. Providing a mirror and archive for born digital content such as video and podcasts is one of the core goals of DLARC. Additions to DLARC also include presentations recorded at radio communications conferences, including GRCCon, the GNU Radio Conference, and the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. A growing reference library of past radio catalogs includes catalogs from Ham Radio Outlet and C-Crane. DLARC is growing to be a massive online library of materials and collections related to amateur radio and early digital communications. It is funded by a significant grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications, ARDC, to create a digital library that documents, preserves, and provides open access to the history of this community. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to be one of the pioneering contributors to the DLARC. Anyone with material to contribute to the DLARC library, questions about the project, or interest in similar digital library building projects for other professional communities, please contact K. Savitz, K6, KJN, Program Manager Special Collections via email at K, that's spelled K A Y, at archive.org. Again, that's K, spelled K A Y, at archive.org. On November 6th, engine trouble was plaguing the Captain Chad as the 80 foot commercial fishing vessel made its way through the water south of Jamaica with eight passengers aboard. The captain called for help over various frequencies on the commercial HF Marine Band, but without luck. Fearing the calm waters would soon get rougher and more dangerous, he declared an emergency and called for help again, this time 
tuning to his radio's preset frequency of 14.300 MHz. Tommy Turry, W5TEY, who is on duty as Maritime Mobile Service Operator, heard the call and got the boat's location from the captain, Curtis Jackson. Tom telephoned the Jamaican Coast Guard, but after getting no response, he reached out to the United States Coast Guard in Virginia. The Maritime Mobile Service Network then lost contact. All it could do was leave information about the Captain Chad and ask all incoming net control stations to try to reestablish contact. Two days later, a much happier contact took place. Tom heard from the fishing vessel's owner. The boat and everyone on board were rescued without incident thanks to the vital information passed along by the Maritime Mobile Service Network. Tom said simply, it's what we train to do. NASA astronaut and former U.S. Air Force Colonel Bob Behnken, KG-5GGX, is retiring from NASA after 22 years of service. His last day with the agency was Friday, November 11th. Behnken's career highlights included 93 days in space on two space shuttle Endeavour flights and the first crewed flight of the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. Behnken was pilot and joint operations commander for the first crewed flight test of the SpaceX Dragon. Known as Demo-2, that flight launched Behnken and former NASA astronaut Doug Hurley to the International Space Station May 30, 2020, and safely returned them to Earth August 2, 2020. Behnken joined NASA at Johnson in July 2000 as an astronaut candidate. On his first space flight in 2008, Behnken was a Space Shuttle Endeavour mission specialist for the STS-123 delivery of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency's Kibo Laboratory and the Canadian Space Agency's Special Purpose Dexterous Manipulator to the space station, also known as Dexter. Behnken performed three spacewalks and operated the station's robotic arm both with and without Dexter attached. He flew again in 2010 as a mission specialist for STS-130, which delivered the station's tranquility module and its cupola, the station's seven-window Earth-facing observation post. He served as the mission's lead spacewalker, performing three additional spacewalks to install the newly arrived module. Behnken completed 10 spacewalks across his three missions, spending more than 61 hours working in the vacuum of space. Behnken grew up in St. Ann, Missouri, and graduated from Pattonville High School in Maryland Heights, Missouri. He earned dual Bachelor of Science degrees in Physics and Mechanical Engineering from Washington University in St. Louis in 1992, a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from California Institute of Technology in Pasadena in 1993, and a Doctorate in Mechanical Engineering from the California Institute of Technology in 1997. Behnken was commissioned via the Air Force Reserve Officers Training Corps and attended the Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Before retiring from active military service in February 2022, Behnken had achieved the rank of colonel and flown more than 2,000 flight hours in more than 25 different types of aircraft. The CW Operators Club, or CW Ops, is now accepting nominations for the 2023 Advancing the Art of CW Award. For more details, we go to John Ross, KB8IDJ, who files this special report. This award recognizes individuals, groups, or organizations that have made the greatest contributions toward the advancing of the art and practice of radio communications by Morris Code. Award candidates must be one or more of the following, authors of publications related to CW, CW recruiters, trainers, mentors, coaches, or instructors, public advocates of CW, organizers of CW activities, designers and inventors who have advanced the art or practice of CW, and other contributors to the art or practice of CW. The award is not limited to amateur radio operators alone or their organizations, and nominations may be made by anyone, not just CW Ops members. Nominations must be emailed, and that must be postmarked by March 10th of 2023. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Nominations must include a detailed explanation supporting the nominee qualifications according to the above criteria, nominee, name, call sign if applicable, and contact information, including their postal address, email address, and telephone number, as well as the name, telephone number, email address, and call sign if applicable of the person submitting the nomination. The winners will be announced and presented with a plaque at Dayton Hamvention 2023. If the recipient is not present, their plaque will be sent to them. Information about past recipients dating back to 2016 can be found at cwops.org forward slash cwops dash award dash winners. For more information about the award criteria, visit cwops.org webpage. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The Digital Doodad Show. Hey, I like that.
Maybe I'll call it that. It's time for the Digital Doodad Show. I'm your Digital Doodaddy, Leo Laporte. Time to talk about computers and the Internet. So many of you, so many people suffer with Internet that is not good. And it's not the problem. Now, sometimes I admit absolutely could be the problem of the Internet service provider. And, and pity the poor DSL provider because they're riding on top of two little copper wires that were designed for a scratchy phone 90 years ago. And the fact that they're getting any data down that pipe of any speed at all is kind of amazing. But that's DSL technology. But, you know, if you have bad wires in the house, if you have bad wires outside the house, all sorts of things can happen. It can be horribly unreliable. So, of course, if you have DSL, you know, it's hard to diagnose. All you could do is rely upon the kindness of your Internet service provider and hope that that Internet service provider is a good ISP and will look at the wires and 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 say, oh, yeah, we see where the problem lies. If it lies in your house, it gets more complicated because uh, they're not really responsible for the wires in your house. In fact, you may remember when you when you got phone service and you got DSL service, they may have offered you a in-house insurance plan, an in-house wiring insurance plan so that, you know, you pay a buck a month or whatever and they guarantee to fix the in-house wiring if there's problems because that's a, a nightmare. And I don't know if you've ever gone outside to look at the phone block in your house and the wires coming into that and you could see why it's amazing you're getting a megabit, let alone five or six megabits per second over that. So DSL, you know, struggles a little bit because of that distance from the office, the quality of the copper, inside and out. And then, you know, service providers vary greatly. They also vary greatly in their willingness to support it. However, if I were going to make a rule, a general rule about where Internet service falls down, most of the time it's the router. And, and obviously this means just more than 51% of the time or whatever, 60, probably 70% of the time. It's not all cases, but the router is one of those things people just, they think of it as an appliance, they set it, they forget it, they have it for years, they pay no attention to it. And if you, But yet, if you have discovered that internet problems can go away if you reboot the router, by the way, if you call your internet service provider, it's the first thing they'll say, reboot the router, unplug it, plug it back in, and if that fixes it, router may be at fault. Sometimes seeing if there's new firmware and downloading it could fix it, but most of the time not. Most of the time it's just worn out. They do wear out. Uh, they get unreliable. They're cheap. And as I mentioned, you could, you should get a much better router in general. Most people are putting up with, suffering with a bad router more often than anything else. Of course, the internet service providers kind of exacerbate the problem because they very often will give you the router with the cable modem, often in one box, which means it's not very good to begin with. And then they charge you five bucks a month for it. They rent it back and they never update it or anything. They just wait till you complain. That's why in general, what I recommend is if you must use the DSL modem provided by the provider, but not their router, use your own, go out and get your own better router, get a modern router an a b g a c router that's their <laughs> no, it's, and this is why people don't so the the wi-fi technology is 802.11 the first one that came out was just 802.11 and then there was a i'm oh, sorry b then there was a then there was g and now it's ac those are the different standards ac is the most modern if you get an ac router it'll do all the other ones and, uh, and you're going to spend more than you think. because. And by the way, I think it's worth it. You're only going to buy one of these routers every few years. And how much do you spend a month on your internet service? I mean, it, and how much of an annoyance is it when it goes out? Really annoying. You wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't buy a water heater that only worked three hours a day. You wouldn't buy, you know, you, this, is, you want, this isn't a utility. You want it to work. There are, there is a whole category of newer, very costly Wi-Fi routers that work differently than the traditional. Um, that certainly wouldn't hurt either. Get a newer modem, or uh, you know, make sure it's that your internet service provider says it's okay, 
and that you buy one that's on their recommended list, but often that'll help too. This new category of Wi-Fi routers do things a little differently uh, than the ASUS. Now, I'm still using, uh, I use a, I have a variety of solutions in my house because it's kind of a lab. I use the AC3200 from ASUS as an excellent Wi-Fi router. Kind of looks like a spider. It's uh, three bands. It's, uh, it, you know, 2.45 and 2.5 gigabit uh, bands. Very good router. Very expensive. But like I said, you get what you pay for. Even more expensive, though, is this new category. They're mesh routers. They work differently. In the past, if you had bad Wi-Fi connectivity as you get more distant from your access point, you would put an extender in, an Asus and Linksys and Netgear, and everybody sells these. But they don't they would kind of work. They don't work great. And so, but you could you could kind of expand the footprint of your wireless access. In theory, these guys only go about 150 feet. In practice, even less because there's walls and all sorts of materials in between you and your access point, and it's sometimes hard for them to get through. So an extender will help, but I'm really starting to be interested in this new category. It's unfortunately extremely pricey. Eero was the first, E-E-R-O. So you put a base station unit in, and then two satellite units. We I've found this to give me the best wireless footprint I've ever had. I mean, to the point where I can be halfway down the street and still on my Wi-Fi certainly covers my whole yard and the house and everything. But very, very pricey. There's some competitors coming. There's one that's delayed called Luma, L-U-M-A. I've also ordered that. I'll let you know when that comes out. And there's a newer uh, technology, won't be out till maybe Christmas, called the Plume. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week. It's different, so I don't have to test it, but it's less expensive. These guys work by creating a mesh as opposed to extending. It's a little more complicated. They also do some smart things. For instance, one of the real issues with routers is keeping it up to date, especially for security. Another reason to get rid of your old router, it's almost certainly insecure. People, you know, people like uh, the hacker, the hacker group Lizard Squad uh, last Christmas used insecure routers, tens of thousands of them, to bring down the PlayStation network and the Xbox network uh, by just taking over people's routers. So you want a secure router. The Eero routers are updated constantly without any of an intervention on your part. They just they send you updates, which is the way it should be. So they're much more secure. They also claim they're going to update it to make it faster and more reliable as well. Be interesting to watch. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high-tech Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. Here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. Our founding fathers knew that the United States would have to enter into legal and binding agreements with foreign countries. Thus, in Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, they gave the President the power to make treaties with approval of two-thirds of the Senate. Over the years, the Supreme Court has ruled that provisions of a treaty are constitutional and legally binding, even if the exact same provisions contained in a law not covered by a treaty would not pass the constitutional test. Under the Radio Act of 1927 and the regulations issued by the Federal Radio Commission, amateurs were in the catbird seat, to use a popular phrase of the day. They had over 2,700 kilocycles of spectrum between 160 and 20 meters, plus another 15,000 kilocycles at 5 meters. They had a Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, who was a strong proponent of amateur radio. Congress was supportive and sympathetic. Nothing could go wrong. Or could it? Yes, it could. An international radio telegraph conference was scheduled for Washington, D.C. on October 4, 1927. Here, participants from 74 nations would gather to hammer out an international treaty covering the entire known radio spectrum. Once this treaty was accepted by the Senate, it would become law and supersede anything contained in the 1927 Act. 
Although amateurs could count on the full support of the U.S. delegation, we had only one vote, the same as any of the other 73 participants. So how much support could we count on from the other countries? Sadly, not much. Democracy was still a foreign idea to most nations. Many hovered in that gray area between the old world monarchies and fascism, communism. Communications were a government monopoly. Individual private stations were feared. They could compete with the government stations or they could be used in anti-government activities. This attitude was even present in the representatives from England and France. As for the other countries, many were blatantly anti-amateur radio. Germany, for example, stated that private stations could violate the rights of the state. Switzerland was on the record against amateur radio. Japan would tolerate amateurs, however, they would have to use phantom, i.e. non-radiating antennas. In other words, you could have a transmitter, you just couldn't radiate a signal. One proposal would only give amateurs frequencies below 13 meters or above 23 megacycles. Fortunately, the ARRL and the International Amateur Radio Union, which was founded in 1925, were well aware of this hostility and had made detailed preparations. The IARU and the ARRL both had made presentations to the various delegations prior to the start of the conference. Support of the amateur community was also received from private radio interests and radio manufacturers. The ARRL and the IARU would both have delegates attending the conference. And so, after the opening session, which was addressed by President Calvin Coolidge and Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, who was also president of the conference, the delegates divided themselves into subcommittees and began to work. England, the European country most favorable to amateur radio, made its first proposal. Amateurs would be allowed in the 150 to 200 meter band or 1500 to 2000 kilocycles with a maximum power of 10 watts. The ARRL and IARU delegates, KB Warner, HP Maxim, and CH Stewart, as well as W.D. Terrell, who was chief of the radio division in the Department of Commerce, indicated that this was unacceptable. The British came up with a compromise position. Amateurs would have the 150 meter band, as well as bands at 2.75 megacycles, 3.66 megacycles, 5.5 megacycles, 11 megacycles, 22 megacycles, and 44 megacycles. Except for the 1500 kilocycle to 2000 kilocycle segment, each band would be only 100 kilocycles wide. The total amateur allocations under the British proposal were 1100 kilocycles, of which 900 kilocycles was in the known usable spectrum below 15 megacycles. This was a 60% reduction for American hams in the frequencies below 15 megacycles and a whopping 93% reduction when you counted our 4 to 5 meter band. Nevertheless, many delegates urged the U.S. and the ARRL and the IARU representatives to accept this proposal. They pointed out that it was far more generous than many countries were willing to give on their own. With the use of CW and crystal control, it was argued, there would be enough room for all amateurs. Many were afraid that if the British compromise wasn't accepted, a more restrictive amateur band plan would take its place. The ARRL and IARU delegates had one thing in their corner, however, the strong support of Secretary Hoover and the American delegation. With that, they found the strength to carefully carry on. They were diplomatic, but they were persistent. Maxim, Stewart, and Warner proceeded step by step. The 160 meter band was first agreed on from 1715 to 2000 kilocycles. Next, it was decided that the remaining amateur bands would be at the 80, 40, 20 meter spots. How wide they would be was the next argument. On the 80 meter band, everyone was at a stalemate until it was suggested that the band could be from 3500 kilocycles to 4000 kilocycles on a non-exclusive basis. This was accepted by all of the delegates. Each country could decide for themselves how much of the 500 kilocycles they would allocate to amateurs. Next on the agenda was 20 meters. The United States wanted 14,000 to 16,000 kilocycles. There was no way any of the other delegates would agree. 
After much debate, the U.S. delegation realized that 400 kilocycles was the maximum they were going to get and acquiesced. With 160, 80, and 20 out of the way, and the U.S. assured of at least adequate domestic and international allocations, the subcommittee turned to 40 meters. The American delegation wanted 7,000 to 8,000 kilocycles. The most any other country was willing to offer was 7,000 to 7,200. Germany, in fact, put a high power station on 7,200 kilocycles in order to thwart a large amateur allocation on 40 meters. Back and forth the debate went. The other delegates finally offered 225 kilocycles. Maxim and Stewart felt they had played their last hand and wanted to accept the proposal. Warner, however, still pushed for 400 kilocycles. More debates followed. Finally, other delegates agreed to 300 kilocycles. From that point, additional bands were then set up at 10 meters and 5 meters. When the dust had settled, the conference had approved the following amateur bands. 1715 to 2000 kilocycles, 3500 to 4000 kilocycles, 7000 to 7300 kilocycles, 14,000 to 14,400 kilocycles, 28 to 30 megacycles, and 56 to 60 megacycles. This was a 37.5% reduction in the frequencies amateurs had under the U.S. regulations. However, it was a vast increase for the amateurs of most other countries. Furthermore, the frequencies approved by the conference established amateur radio under international law, something which had not existed before. Given the circumstances, this was a major victory for amateur radio. Initially, there was some opposition by a minority of the U.S. hams to the ratification of the treaty. The ARRL and the vast majority of amateurs, however, supported it, knowing that a small loss in frequencies was insignificant in comparison to the international recognition now given to amateur radio. The Senate agreed and on March 21, 1928, ratified the treaty. As a postscript, Herbert Hoover, the Secretary of Commerce, who had always supported amateur radio 100%, was elected President of the United States in November 1928, although most remember his administration as coinciding with the onset of the Great Depression, it was also the time of the greatest growth in amateur radio history. From the 1929 total of 16,289 hams to the 1933 count of 41,555, Amateur radio grew 255% in four years. Before his death at the age of 90 on October 20th, 1964, Hoover would live to see his son, Herbert Hoover Jr., W6ZH, elected president of the ARRL and see an amateur running for president of the United States, Barry Goldwater, K7UGA, K3UIG. Whatever historians may think of his administration, Hams will always remember Herbert Hoover as a friend to amateur radio. Next time, the ancient amateur archives will begin to explore the battle over the VHF spectrum in the mid-1940s. Did you ever wonder what happened to TV Channel 1? The ancient amateur archives will have the answers. Foundations of Amateur Radio One of the many acronyms that define our world of amateur radio is VFO, it stands for Variable Frequency Oscillator. That doesn't explain much if you're not familiar with the purpose of it and just how special this aspect of amateur radio is. Much of the world of radio beyond our hobby, like broadcast television, Wi-Fi and Citizen Band or CB, to name a few, uses radio spectrum in a particular way. On a television, you change channels to switch between stations. Similarly, a Wi-Fi network uses specific channels to make your wireless network a reality. And the same goes for CB, different channels to make yourself heard. Looking specifically at CB for a moment, if you look at channel 8, for example, depending on which type of equipment you have, your radio might be using 27.055 MHz or 476.575 MHz or 476.6 MHz. Each of those frequencies can be described as CB channel 8. The first is on the 27 MHz or 11 meter band. The second is if you're using a 40 channel radio, which is now depreciated. And the third is if you're using an 80 channel radio. If you look at digital broadcast television, channel 8 is on 191.5 MHz. 
On Wi-Fi, channel 8 is on 2.447 GHz or 5.040 GHz. You get the point, depending on where you are as a user of Radio Spectrum, channel 8 might mean a whole host of different things, and as I've described with CB Radio, that might even change over time. Harry Potter needed magic to reach platform 9 and 3 quarters at King's Cross Station to get to school. In a channelized world, getting to an in-between frequency is not possible if you're using licensed equipment. Unless you're a radio amateur. Then you can use magic to get into the gaps. That magic is called the VFO. You might recall that our radios use many different frequencies internally to be able to filter out specifically what signal you want to hear. Most of those frequencies are fixed. In fact, in the vast majority of cases, these are actually tuned and calibrated to work in a very specific way. The one exception is the VFO. It's by nature variable. It's likely calibrated, but it's not fixed, and that allows our community to tune our equipment to any frequency we desire. The traditional user interface for this is a big knob on the front of your radio, colloquially referred to as the dial, as in turn the dial to change frequency. This allows us something quite rare in radio land. We can be frequency agile. It means that if there's interference at a specific frequency, we can tweak our VFO and slightly modify where our radio is tuned. You use this almost subconsciously when you're on HF trying to tune to a particular station. In the world of software radio, there's likely no knob. You type in a number and the variable frequency oscillator in the radio is tuned to another frequency, and the output signal, or transmit signal if you're making noise on air, changes to another frequency. Digital modes like Whisper, which generally use a very specific frequency, also vary that frequency, but in a different way. You set your radio to the appropriate so-called dial frequency, let's say 28.1246 MHz on the 10 meter band, and then the software alters the signal by up to 200 Hz to change within the available audio range of your radio, altering between a low of 1400 Hz and a high of 1600 Hz, making the actual whisper frequency on 10 meters between 28.1260 and 28.1262 MHz. I'm mentioning the whisper example because while we are frequency agile in our hobby, we do use channels as well. There's a specific set of frequencies set aside, channels, if you like, for Whisper, FT8 and other modes. We do the same on the 2 meter and 70 centimeter bands, where we have rules for where repeaters are allowed to be. It means that we get the best of both worlds. We have the stability and institutional knowledge where repeaters or some modes go, but we also get to play in any spot we want. For example, there's nothing stopping me and a friend setting our radio to some random frequency within our license allocation, an outside pre-allocated space, and run a whisper transmitter there. Only the two of us will know about it, well at least at first, but it allows us to experiment away from other users who might experience interference from our tests and exploration. The VFO is what makes our hobby so very interesting, and it's what makes it possible to do weird and wonderful experiments. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The Federal Communications Commission announced this month that it is opening a new window of applications under its Honors Engineer Program. The one-year developmental program may lead to a term or permanent appointment. The Commission is accepting applications from recent graduates with an engineering degree and current students graduating in December 2022. Among the duties included in the job description, is training to perform propagation analysis of terrestrial, satellite, and or airborne systems, or evaluating the emission characteristics of various transmitters to validate the coexistence with neighboring systems. Projects may also involve various computer software engineering and scientific applications. An FCC news release describes that honors engineers will work alongside senior staff on projects, including developing technical rules and policy approaches to enable the U.S. to introduce new communications technologies and services such as 5G, 6G, advanced Wi-Fi, the Internet of Things, next-generation TV broadcasting, and new broadband satellite systems, facilitating wireless and wireline broadband service deployment throughout the nation, including to rural and underserved areas. 
identifying technologies to improve access to communication services for all Americans, especially those with disabilities. Enabling public safety and homeland security agencies, as well as various enterprises within various market sectors, such as healthcare, energy, education, and transportation, to introduce new communications technologies and developing policies that encourage innovation and investment in and transitions to new communications technologies, devices, and services that will support job creation and economic growth. Engineers are deployed throughout the FCC and from space innovation to new broadcast standards to 6G and beyond, the FCC's policy portfolio is filled with interesting and challenging engineering work, said FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel. Our Honors Engineers program is a unique opportunity for the newest engineers to work closely with experienced professionals in this field to ensure that the FCC is best prepared to face the challenges of next-generation communications networks. This week, the Commission has agreed to extend its deadline for accepting applications from graduating law students and current judicial clerks for its fall 2023 attorney honors program. In an effort to accommodate all qualified candidates directly or indirectly affected by the recent extreme weather events and power outages, the commission will keep the application window open until 11.59 p.m. Eastern on November 30th, 2022. This short extension should provide those additional time a to assist their families as needed and then submit their online application materials, the Commission said on Monday. For those seeking additional information on the FCC Attorney Honors Program and the application process, a visit to FCC.gov slash Attorney Honors Program should yield most of the answers. According to Funk Telegram Magazine, an Atena-friendly change in the state building laws is expected to be adopted in Baden-Württemberg in Germany. This is the same state in which ham radio Friedrichshafen, Europe's largest ham fest, takes place every year. This new regulation will permit antennas to be installed on masts as high as 15 meters or nearly 50 feet in residential areas and 20 meters or 65 feet outside of residential areas without the need for planning permission. Until now, the state's height limit was 10 meters or 32 feet, consistent with the other states in Germany. Proponents of this change are hoping this will enable more complete digital cell phone coverage without the burden of paperwork previously associated with the antenna installation. The fact that the law applies to all radio masts would, of course, be a benefit to radio hams in the state as well. The state parliament is expected to debate the draft law change soon and if approved, its enactment would come shortly afterwards. Meanwhile, Germany's proposed new N-Class entry-level license could be in place as early as January the 1st of 2023. The possible addition is being reviewed by the German regulator as a way to add a third license class to the existing E-Novice and A full license classes. A change in the regulations would give N-Class operators call signs with the prefix DN, and the current DN call signs, which are only used for training purposes under supervision of a licensed TAM, would be cancelled on December 31st of this year to be replaced by the use of a DN prefix. Bruce Page KK5DO has filed his weekly AMSAT report, and with so many launch opportunities coming around, it's nice to see another satellite on its way to orbit. CAMSAT launched CAS-10 or XW-4 on November 12th in a cargo ship to the Chinese space station. It is scheduled to be deployed on December 15th with a 42.9 degree inclination. That satellite will have a VU linear transponder with a downlink on 435.180 MHz and an uplink on 145.870 MHz. The CW beacon will be on 435.575 MHz. One unique feature of the satellite is an onboard camera. As it takes pictures, they are stored on a flash memory. Hams can send a DTMF tone sequence to the satellite, and the satellite will transmit those pictures. The use of CW to send telemetry makes it easy for hams to receive the information without the need for any decoding software. And with Thanksgiving approaching, Bruce would like to wish all of the AMSAT uh, volunteers and users hope and, uh, and your family have a safe and happy holiday. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA 
in Seattle, Washington, who reports that at 0334 UTC on November 18th, the Australian Space Weather Forecast Center issued this geomagnetic disturbance warning. A moderately large coronal hole will rotate into a geo-effective location on November 19th. Combined with possible weak glancing interaction of recent CMEs, geomagnetic activity is expected in the coming days. Increased geomagnetic activity expected due to coronal hole high-speed wind streams from November 19th and 20th, 2022. Sunspot numbers and solar flux did not seem to correlate this week. Flux rose and spots fell. Average daily sunspot numbers declined from 79.8 to 72.3, but average solar flux rose from 129 to 137.2. This suggests the number and area of sunspots was less, but the 10.7 centimeter radiation from those spots increased. A new sunspot emerged on November 10th, another on November 13th, and two more on November 16th, the last day of our reporting week, which runs Thursday through the following Wednesday. Another sunspot group emerged the next day on November 17th. So exactly how is this sunspot cycle progressing? Well, looking back one year ago in our report, the average daily sunspot number was only 36.4. Solar flux was at 89.1. So if the activity seems a bit lackluster, we can see the cycle making steady progress. Solar cycle 25 is expected to peak around July 2025, about 32 months from now. So why do we care about these numbers? Well, we get better HF propagation at higher frequencies when X-rays from the sun are more intense and they correlate with sunspot numbers and the 10.7 centimeter radiation. This radiation changes the ionosphere, increasing density. For example, back in 1957 through 1959, at the peak of solar cycle 19, the radiation was so intense that 10 meters was open worldwide around the clock. Solar cycle 19 had by far the highest sunspot count in recorded history, with nothing like it before or since. So taking a look ahead, here is the prediction for the solar flux. 120 on November 20th and 21st, 122 on November 22nd, 125 on November 23rd and 24th, 115 on November 25th and 26th, 120 and 125 on November 27th and 28th, and 130 on November 29th and 30th. The predicted planetary A index is up next, which gives us a clue into possible geomagnetic unrest will be 16, 20, and 12 on November 19th through the 21st, then 8, 5, 8, 15, and 18 on November 22nd through the 26th, and then 12, 8, 5, 5, 12, 18, and 8 on November 27th through December 3rd. The ARRL 10-meter contest is coming up and will take place during the weekend of December 10th and 11th, and you can expect better propagation than we saw in 2020 and 2021. Just ahead in uh, radio sport contesting on November 19th through the 20th, the LZDX contest, that's CW and phone. November 19th as well, the All-Austrian 160-meter contest, that's CW. November 19th and 20th, the REF 160-meter contest, CW. And also on November 19th, the Feldhell Sprint, that's digital. November 19th as well, the RSGB 1.8 MHz contest, that's CW. And on November 19th through the 21st, the ARL Super 6 contest, uh, that's for single sideband, and of course, that is phone. And in upcoming section state and division conventions on December 9th through 10th, the uh, Tampa Bay Ham Fest hosting the ARRL West Coast Central Florida Section Convention. That's in Plant City, Florida. On January 7th, the Ham Radio University hosting the ARRL New York City Long Island Section Convention. That is an online event. And on January 20th through the 21st, the Southwest Florida Regional Ham Fest hosting the ARRL Southern Florida Section Convention. That's in Fort Myers, Florida. With the past few months bringing great weather for outdoor activations, parks on the air QSOs have grown by a high percentage. Matt here, N3NWV, brings us the latest statistics. Hi everyone, I'm Matt, N3NWV, here with your October 2022 POTUS stats and news update. October included the fall Support Your Parks weekend event, and the stats show a big jump from last month. We had 15,781 activations by 2,808 activators from 5,483 parks. 47 DXCC entities were represented this month, and we reached a total of 706,846 QSOs, a month-over-month -month increase of 
Congratulations to all of our category leaders for October. And as always, a big thank you to everyone who participates in the POTA program. Speaking of participating, our Park a Day Bailey Sprott list hasn't changed notably this month. We still have five activators and two dozen hunters on track for pressing the POTA button every day in 2022. Good luck to all now that we're down to the final two months of the year. The October 15th and 16th Support Your Parks weekend was a huge success, generating over 100,000 CUSOs. Nearly 1,100 activators got to over 1,500 parks and worked over 15,000 hunters. All in all, 34 DXCC entities participated in the weekend one way or another. That wraps it up for this month. 7-3 and POTA on. An exciting new presentation at the Wales Millennium Center called A Signal Across Space a title that refers to the Morse code transmission sent on May 13th of 1897 by Guglielmo Marconi across a stretch of open sea. The signal traveled between Flatholm Island in the Bristol Channel and Lavernock Point on the South Wales coast. The moment becomes reality, or rather virtual reality, for audience members at the center who are given special VR headsets, enabling them to experience themes in music, poetry, and dance that were inspired by Marconi's experiment. Viewers see it all in a 360-degree inversive experience. The 50-minute film has several sections, of which one uses part of a lecture from the Barry and District Radio Society describing Marconi's experiment. Another section, called In the Air, recounts the story of Marconi's 19th-century experiment more directly. The center has also assembled a small exhibit for audience members to view afterwards, offering a closer look at Lavernock, where Marconi received those first transmissions. The program concludes on November 20th. The clock is running out for amateurs in Australia who want to submit comments on a proposed amateur class license and also on a separate proposal that would permit amateurs to increase operating power from 400 watts to 1 kilowatt peak envelope power under the latter advanced class amateurs. The class license is proposed to take effect in July 2023. The Australia Communications and Media Authority will accept all submissions until 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Time on November 29th. CamSat's CAS-10 XW4 satellite was launched on November 12, 2022, carried on the Zanshu-5 cargo spacecraft to the Chinese space station. Deployment from the Chinese space station is expected on or about December 15th. The satellite will be active immediately upon deployment into its own 400-kilometer orbit with an inclination of 42.9 degrees. CAS-10 is an 8U CubeSat, approximately 228 by 455 by 100 millimeters, with 12 kilograms mass. A follow-on mission from CAS-9 and also known as Hope 4, carrying a VU mode linear transponder, a UHF CW telemetry beacon, a UHF AX.25 4.8 and 9.6 kilobits per second GMSK telemetry downlink, and a space camera. CAS 10 carries a VHF uplink and UHF downlink linear transponder with a bandwidth of 30 kilohertz. This transponder will work all day during the life cycle of the satellite, and amateur radio enthusiasts around the globe can use it for two-way radio relay communications. CAS-10 carries a camera, and the pictures it takes are stored in the flash memory on the satellite. We have designated a simple remote control system based on DTMF, and amateur radio enthusiasts around the globe can send DTMF commands to download the camera photos. The CW Beacon uses Morse code to send satellite telemetry data, which is also a feature that is widely welcomed by amateur radio enthusiasts. Downlink frequencies for VHF-UHF linear transponder 435.180 MHz and for UHF-CW telemetry beacon 435.575 MHz and for telemetry 435.725 MHz. Also, an uplink for the transponder is 145.870 MHz have been coordinated. The San Angelo Amateur Radio Club, based in San Angelo, Texas, celebrated their 100th anniversary on October 15, 2022. The club is engaged in a century of community service, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, education, emergency preparedness, and disaster response. 
Founded in 1922, the San Angelo Amateur Radio Club held their first meeting on June 14th of that year, and membership today has grown to 40 members. The celebration took place at their clubhouse and included a tailgate swap meet that began at 9 a.m., amateur radio operators working to make contacts with 100 stations and the Boy Scouts Jamboree on the air. The club call sign W5QX honors Carl Breinger, who originally held a call sign 5QX before the W prefix was added. He was one of the earliest members of the club. The club is currently working in partnership with Angelo State University's Mayor Museum, located on the campus of Angelo State University, to create an exhibit that will tell the story of local radio pioneers. Topics will include amateur radio operators, retail radio business, public safety radio innovators, and broadcast radio stations that formed in the Concho Valley area in the 1920s and 30s. Club member Mike Dominey, KD5URW, said SAARC is the only club within a 70-mile radius of San Angelo, Texas. Our club and amateur radio emergency service volunteers cover 14,000 square miles with a population of 165,000, Dominey said. With cell phone coverage only along major roads and highways, amateur radio is the only communication during storms and tornadoes. Dominey added that there are only 381 licensed amateur radio operators in the area, and the club is working on grants to add and upgrade repeaters under a five-year plan. The San Angelo Amateur Radio Club is an ARRL-affiliated club. The 2022 ARRL November Sweepstakes Phone will run from 2100 UTC on Saturday, November 19th, to 0259 UTC on Monday, November 21. This is the phone SSB version of the contest, as the CW Sweepstakes counterpart ran during the weekend of November 5th through the 7th. So get out your microphones. With more details on this year's contest, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. The annual ARL November Sweepstakes is the premier domestic contest in the U.S. and Canada and the oldest domestic radio sport event. The first was held in 1930. The SS Contest Exchange has deep roots in message handling protocol and replicates a radiogram preamble in SS Stations Exchange. Each year, thousands of amateur radio operators at all skill levels attempt to beat their personal contact records, win awards in various categories, and achieve the coveted clean sweep by contacting all 84 ARRL and Radio Amateurs of Canada, RAC, sections in a single weekend. Overall and division winners will be awarded a plaque recognizing their efforts. Plaques are sponsored by individuals, groups, clubs, or by the principal award sponsor, ICOM America. Certificates will be awarded to those who have the top scores for CW and phone operations in each category and each ARRL RAC section and division. More information about the 2022 ARRL November sweepstakes is available at ARRL.org slash sweepstakes. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. In sweepstakes, contesting stations exchange the following. A consecutive serial number. Operators do not have to add leading zeros on contact numbers less than 100. Precedence, Q for single op, QRP. A for single op, low power up to 150 watts. B for single op, higher power greater than 150. U for op single, unlimited, regardless of power. M for multi-operator, regardless of power. And S for school clubs, your call sign. A, check the last two digits of the year of the first license for either operator or the station. And finally, your section, that is ARRL or RAC section. Printable certificates will be available for download at ARRL certificates. For more information about the ARRL November sweepstakes, available at ARRL.org slash sweepstakes. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, Emergency Management Institute, has released a new online study course and exam on preparing the nation for space weather events. The course identifier is IS-66. ARRL Director of Emergency Management Josh Johnston, KE5MHV, took the course and passed the exam. Johnston said, this course provides some interesting insight to the federal government's role and response to space weather events. 
It also explains the levels of response the government uses in regard to space weather events. Johnston concluded, this course would be a good training course for any ham to gain a better understanding of how space weather affects communications here on Earth. This is a useful course and only takes about two hours to take online, Johnston said. A FEMA student ID is required and is free from the Emergency Management Institute online. What modern music lover doesn't remember compact discs or watching movies on DVD? While that shape is no longer widely used to hold the latest hits or some favorite classics, the compact disc does hold something else, the promise of a new kind of plate-shaped ultra-tiny satellite. In fact, the disc sat, as it is called, is in development as a potential replacement for the widely known CubeSat with the hopes of creating a new standard. Because they are so thin, measuring 1 inch or 2.5 centimeters wide, many can be launched at the same time, stacked inside a payload for later deployment on an individual basis. Although its dimensions can be changed, the demonstration disc sat also measures 1 meter or not quite 40 inches in diameter, leaving plenty of room for solar cells. NASA has funded the project by engineers at Aerospace Corporation, a national nonprofit company headquartered in California. Aerospace hopes to get a quartet of disc sets launched in either 2023 or 2024 through the Pentagon's space test program. Engineers hope the disc sat will prove suitable for very low Earth orbit, offering low atmospheric drag and the ability to stay up in space for longer periods of time. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Climbing with others. There are times when tower jobs we need to do require helpers assisting us on the ground and with us on the tower. These are special situations which require higher than normal levels of communication between team members. When hauling coax, antennas, sidearms, or other hardware up the tower, Never hoist hardware up the tower with someone underneath the cargo, unless they're wearing the proper safety gear and have been trained in tower work. Let's face it, on a tower, you don't get a second chance. There are at least three sides to each tower. So keep the lower climber on a different side, and besides, a freestanding tower is happier when you spread the load more evenly. So before you start to do tower work with other climbers and ground crew, stop, take a moment, and discuss with everyone exactly what you intend to do the goals to accomplish, the order the tasks will be done in, special hardware you may need, and a discussion about hoisting things up and down the tower. The guy on the ground should always have the job of keeping sidewalk supervisors away from the base area of the tower. Even a quarter twenty zinc plated nut falling 80 feet onto the top of an unprotected skull can leave a permanent dent, not to mention a thud that will be ringing for hours in the victim's head. There's a good argument here for wearing a hard hat. Few hams I know of own one or even know where to buy one, so the next best thing is only one person climbing at a time. If climbing with a person already strapped on working above you, choose a different side to climb on. If you're already on the tower, but the antenna you need to work on is like six feet out on a sidearm, a different set of rules apply. It is most likely that the sidearm is fully capable of holding your weight as is. My personal rule is to never totally trust any part of the tower. This includes sidearms. So I bring along my trusty 15-foot strap. This yellow strap is very lightweight but fully capable of pulling a snowbound car out of a ditch. I attach one end of this strap to my harness and the other to a tower leg about 5 feet or more above the point where the sidearm mounts. This strap is strong enough to catch the full weight of the sidearm, myself, and my cargo. If you're expecting to work on a sidearm, I strongly recommend you invest in one of these rescue type straps. Copy down my URL at the end of this segment if you don't know where to start looking for this type of information. Not only did I want this series to offer safety tips, I also wanted to offer hints to make the job go faster and easier. The way I figure, an easier climb is bound to be a safer climb. So let's cover a couple of quick hints. For your tower work, attach them to a short piece of fishing line. Use the woven multi-filament type. Make it long enough to tie a wrist strap in the other end. And tie the other end to the tool you don't wish to drop. If you have a friend with a leather working hobby, a good Christmas present would be a whole bunch of these straps. You can keep your tools securely on your arm and in your hand with one of these straps. Remember to order them large enough to fit around your arm when you're wearing cold weather climbing gear. 
Another one of my favorites is my coaxial cable hanger. I bent the hook in a piece of reinforcing steel bar, the type used in concrete work and often sold at hardware stores. I bent a squared hook in one end, about three inches over and five inches back down, sort of like a giant fishing hook. I use electrical tape to hold the coax onto the rod, then I'm bringing up the tower as I climb. I secure about two feet of the coax to the rod. As I climb, I reach down, grab the hook, and lift it to a tower rung up as high as I can reach. Don't forget a short piece of rope to secure the coax hook to a loop on your climbing belt just in case you might drop it. Some people like to lift coax after they get to the antenna that it connects to. I've had problems with coax damage doing it this way, so this has worked fine for me. I stretch out the coax on the ground and the crew helps feed it up to me as I climb further. This would probably not work on very long lengths and may be unnecessary on shorter towers. Remember, any time you spend learning about tower safety is an investment in yourself. Education is a big part of tower safety. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, in New York State, the Pumpkin Patrol has been an amateur radio holiday tradition since the mid-1980s, pairing hams with New York State Police along one of the state's main thoroughfares, the New York State Thruway. The Thruway extends from Newburgh in the Hudson Valley all the way north and west to Buffalo. For five hours on both Halloween Eve and Halloween night, a traditional time for mischief, New York amateur radio clubs once again work this year with the state police to monitor checkpoints along the overpasses to ensure motorist safety. According to a report on the website mylittlefalls.org, no suspicious activity was reported. State police said that 15 ham organizations participated, representing 19 counties in New York State. The crime-deterring effort was inspired by an incident in 1976 when a CB radio operator was talking to a truck driver on Halloween when the truck driver's windshield was shattered by a pumpkin that had been tossed at the vehicle from an overpass. CB radio operators began the first Halloween safety patrols soon after, and the effort grew to include amateur operators and GMRS groups from there. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. 
With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas,